Hi, my name is Jeff Lindholm. I'm a sales engineering manager with SUSE out of Detroit, Michigan. I'd like to welcome you to my SUSECon digital session, uh, SLE Container Images, everything you need to know about getting started with SLES containers and registry.susa.com. Take a look at our agenda. Um, we'll go through a little bit of history and a little bit of det detail on the container packaging for SUSE Linux Enterprise Server specifically looking at our packaging of the Docker open source project and container creation. We'll talk a bit about the use cases for containers and why containers are interesting to a number of our customers. And then we'll specifically look at a couple of demos around customizing containers and taking a closer look at the container registry, which is where SUSE post, uh, SUSE maintained container uh, real estate for the different products that we support. We'll also talk briefly about the roadmap. So when we look at the use case for containerized infrastructure, there's really been a shift in the marketplace around what's called multimodal IT. And specifically looking at building enterprise Linux platforms for consumption across a variety of different um, factors across the data center, the edge, the, the core environment, we have the ability to basically drive consistency while at the same time using software-defined infrastructure to offer more efficiency and more flexibility in terms of how people are deploying their environments. When we look at how customers are building and delivering cloud-native applications, we've got a bit of a transition going on in the marketplace. So historically, we've got a number of customers that have been building virtual machines. And you look at virtual machines as a unit of compute, there is a full abstraction of the operating system potentially as well as overhead related to the hypervisor and the infrastructure to support the availability of that virtual machine. Those hypervisors could be Linux-based, looking at Zen and KVM. They could be VMware-based, could be Microsoft Hyper-V. It could even be infrastructure as a service cloud, right? If we talk about an application-centric view of this world and moving to container runtime environments, we can reduce the amount of overhead and reduce the complexity of the workload packaging from a maintenance perspective by embracing Linux containers. So you think about large numbers of small containers requiring the efficiency of a shared kernel environment. We basically don't have the overhead of the virtual machines. And yes, this can still work with a virtual machine hosting infrastructure, but that level of management and that level of overhead is not necessarily required. And if you think about how people are developing their workloads these days, the continuous delivery demands for repeatable processes and how people are packaging in CICD, continuous integration, continuous development scenarios does lend nicely to uh, containerized infrastructure in terms of consumption of microservices. A little bit of history, uh, SUSE has been embracing containers for quite some time, going back to Enterprise 11 with the introduction of LXC, which are full distribution Linux containers using uh, C groups as the resource management layer in terms of looking at things like share-based CPU scheduling, hard and soft memory limits, and being able to manipulate the performance threshold of the containerized environment in the context of a shared kernel environment. When we move into the Enterprise 12 timeframe, the SUSE Linux Enterprise Containers module was introduced, at which point we pulled in the Docker Community Project. The Docker Community Project is industry standard in terms of looking at interfacing with containers being provided by third-party ISVs and or containers um, that customers are building themselves or customizing off of the template images that we're providing as part of the Enterprise Linux platform. When we look at SUSE Linux Enterprise 11 and 12, we initially started providing container images in a delivery form factor that was packaged in signed RPMs, and we had a tool called Sleet to Docker that would import those images and verify the signatures and make them available for use locally so that they could be customized or deployed for workloads. When we look at SLES 12 SP3 and forward, the introduction of the SUSE container registry comes into play and ultimately is really there as a foundation for our customers building cloud native infrastructure. So if you think about moving from single server container host to container infrastructure built on Kubernetes or the SUSE container as a service platform, 
We are really leveraging the elements of our multimodal Linux distribution along with the container registry to give customers much more flexibility in how they're consuming their SUSE Linux enterprise server environment. When you think about the multimodal architecture for SLES 15, we have the traditional installation ISO that you're most, most uh, familiar with in terms of looking at our traditional products around SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, SUSE Linux Enterprise Desktop, the SAP variants of our operating system, as well as SLES for HPC and SLURT, our real-time uh, environment. When we look at the software-defined infrastructure, this is really about playing a couple layers higher up in the stack to enable um, infrastructure to be more composable. So if you think about typical workload layers, looking at the service delivery side of this, we have um, a software-defined infrastructure that has been defined as part of ARM architecture, looking at our packaging of Kubernetes, our SUSE enterprise storage platform, and ultimately the platform as a service that's provided by the SUSE cloud application platform. And when we look at container utilization in the context of these products, the use case is very straightforward in terms of providing a much faster development experience that's better coordinated from a DevOps perspective and really looking at the economy that we can provide to the operations team with the container platform and looking at the development um, expertise that can be brought forward in the optimization for the developers that are writing custom code and or packaging apps or our ISV community that is releasing applications for consumption across the environment. All of this is built on our common code base, looking at our multiple architecture support, meaning that we've packaged Docker for consumption on the mainframe as well as uh, Linux on Power as well as x86-64. Container platform today is available on the x86-64 platform. And ultimately, it's really been put in place to support two discrete use cases. We have traditional infrastructure use cases, looking at your typical manual or automated installations, and the ability to put together reproducible builds and what I would call orchestrated management use cases. But we also have software-defined infrastructure use cases that allow for high reusability of images. Um, the ability to have an automatic centralized installation that's always up to date that has really been optimized for size that allows our use case paradigm to transform into that cloud native development experience. When we look at how do containers help transform the IT landscape, the idea is that we can build this DevOps repeatable process as you see in the, the figure eight here in terms of Reentrantly repeating this process, the developers will go through and test, build their code. They will have planning phases, and then the operation side of the, the house will work through the release, the deployment, the operations, and the monitoring. The whole point of this is that we can move towards a sprint-based model and deliver applications much more seamlessly with a very much lower um, level of dependency on the actual microservices or the containers that are being used in the environment. When we look at accelerating application development and delivery, um, you think about contains containers, they're transportable, meaning that I can use a container on my laptop that happens to be running Linux with Docker. I could take the same container to a Kubernetes cluster Oh, and by the way, the container could be a container built on SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, OpenSUSE, or any Linux variant that is supported by the Docker execution environment. You think about these containers working for the future and working across QA environments. The idea here is that we've got consistency that allows for much more portability and the ability to share these workloads between individuals within the operations and developments teams within your organization. So when we think about the collaboration, it not only works on my machine, but it works on your machine or a set of machines that the team is using for QA. So if we think about how to build Linux containers and customizing a Linux container, one of the things that we're going to spend a few minutes talking about is interoperability and compliance with standards. And if you look at the Open Container Initiative, 
This is a working group that SUSE is a member of that we are supporting their standards in terms of our container implementations being what's called OCI compliant. OCI currently contains two specifications. It contains the runtime specification and the image template specification. The runtime specification outlines how a file system bundle can be executed from a uh, container host infrastructure perspective. And typically what you would see is that the container host would download a container from a registry, unpack that image locally, and then have that runtime environment available for execution if a workload was to be deployed. Um, when we think about management of those images, the container host itself supports the execution of OCI compliant images as well as the original Docker v2 image format. All of this is compatible with technology not only including Docker but things like Cryo which is the container engine underlying Kubernetes for example. And the image specification is very interoperable and allows for um, that high reusability use case. When we think about vocabulary, just to make sure that everybody's speaking the same language here, if we were looking at a single uh, container host infrastructure versus a Kubernetes cluster, typically a Docker host would bring in a number of container images. And these container images are templates that can be deployed to marshal the workload that needs to be put into the application execution environment where I've got a workload I want to run. Typically that app might be packaged in a container. So that container image is the read-only template used to create a virtual machine on the host server. A Docker image is made by a series of layers built on one another. And each layer corresponds to a set of changes that can be stored and maintained over time. And these changes are stored in a Docker file. This is what I'm referring to as customization of a container. So if you look at how SUSE builds a SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 15 image, that is a base application runtime environment. It wouldn't necessarily include an Apache web server or Nginx or any of the other open source tools or binaries that you want, want to use in your environment. What most of my customers would do is they would take that base image and create a Docker file that outlines how they would like to customize that image so that they could package their application and make it easier to deploy and maintain over time. So the Docker file is actually the configuration as code for that image template that looks at that customization of what data points do I need to mount, as well as um, looking at the overlay of the images and making sure that we've got a new image that is being built to the specifications of the application or the operations team. The container itself is the actual running instance of a particular Docker image, and each container has a unique container ID, and multiple images of a container can be ran to scale a workload. We can also look at multiple container images for maintenance purposes, right? And ultimately, tools like Kubernetes can help with that workload progression and maintenance lifecycle to keep those containers or pods available through maintenance life cycles so that if we think about end user customers consuming workload executed in a Linux container, the idea would be that they have the ability to um, maintain that infrastructure without necessarily taking an outage. It's the beauty of the microservices development model where the dependencies have been relaxed between all of the different interoperating components and we're looking to potentially maintain those pieces somewhat individually. A registry is storage for container images, and there are different types of registries, including public registries and private registries. We happen to package the Docker distribution registry as part of our container module for SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 12 and 15. There are also a number of public registries that are posted, like the SUSE container registry, which can be found at registry.susa.com. Uh, Docker Hub is another example of a public registry, or you will find registries from a number of other companies where they're posting their software for consumption 
by their end user customers off images that are being maintained by that company themselves. So if you think about Microsoft distributing uh, SQL Server, you think about SAP distributing Data Hub, you're sourcing those containers that that upstream ISV is packaging and you're basically plugging that digital Lego into your infrastructure and when it comes time to maintain it, you're just sourcing the next release of the container and that upstream maintainer is taking care of the compliance and the overall patching and what I would call life cycle of that container from a version control perspective. So if we look at creating container images, I'm pulling an excerpt from the SLES 15 SP1 documentation. There is an example in here on creating a Docker file. And this is just a very simple Docker file that will install a, an application like Vim, for example. So if you wanted to build a container with the VI editor, VI improved, you could create a Docker file that says from registry.susa.com, pull the SLE 15 latest container image run a refresh of the software channels and I would like to install the I, right? Now, when the Docker host machine is registered against an RMT server, an SMT server, or the SUSE customer center, the overlays of the registration subsystem allow for those certificates to be passed through to the container instance, which allows us to have full toolchain access to the software management tooling or the container customization process so that when we go through and create a container from a Docker file, the system will actually source that image and then it will run the transactions like the zipper transaction that you see above to install VI or Nginx or whatever application or workload you're working on. As part of the container creation process, make whatever customizations, permission changes, configuration, um, customizations that are required and ultimately save that container as a new image that can be deployed as a unit of workload. The link to the documentation is at the bottom of this page. When we look at the metadata contained in the container images, starting from SLES 12 SP3 forward with the introduction of the SUSE container registry, we changed the delivery for the base container images that have been built around our uh, long-term enterprise supported releases and all container images now include information such as build timestamps, descriptions, and this information can be looked at from an inspection perspective using the docker inspect command. The labels are shown twice and this is necessary to ensure that the images derived are in sync with the original base image that is visible and not overwritten, understanding that docker really is a system of overlays from a container customization perspective. So you'll see, you'll see details on the vintage of the container, where it was built, its source of um, where it has been posted, and ultimately its reference being, in this case, registry.susa.com and pointing at a specific version release for this particular container, which at one point had a sim link to latest. Since this time, we have released updated containers in line with our patching and security requirements as we update the package manifest for the container and security updates are released, we will periodically rebuild the containers when there is an impact. Let's take a closer look at the Linux container customization process. We'll drop into a SLES 15 environment and I'll go ahead and show you how we can build and customize a Linux container at the command line. Getting started with Docker Community Edition. For my demonstration today, we will be building a Linux container and customizing it by installing the Apache web server. To get started with this process, we will install and configure the Docker daemon and then we will inspect the build environment and then show the execution of the container. To get started, we can take a look at the current registration status of the server. The server has already been patched. I have also added the SLE containers module. The SLE containers module is where the Docker Community Edition binaries are posted for consumption. Zipper will pull in Docker along with any required dependencies. After Docker has been installed, it is required to enable the daemon and start the service. To enable the daemon, we use the systemctl command. 
we can use the same systemctl command to start the service. Once the service is started, we can do a process query to verify that there are no containers running within the environment. We can also query if there are any images currently imported. The answer in both cases is none. Looking at the current working directory for my build, I have two files. There is a Docker file that specifies the configuration directives to customize the image. I also have an index.html that will be overlaid into the image for the web server root. If we take a look at the Docker file, we'll see that we're pulling the latest SLES 15 SP1 image from registry.susa.com. The Docker host is registered with an RMT server. This requires that the self-signed cert be imported, at which point we can run a zipper refresh minus S that will add the software channels required for installing the Apache web server. You will also see after the Apache web server has been installed that we're going to add the index.html at the web server root and configure the service for port 80 TCP. Taking a closer look at the index.html, this is just a simple web page to demonstrate that the container is running and also allow us to interact with the service once the Docker daemon has been executed. To build the container, we're going to give the container a tag or a name. In this case, I will call it Apache Test, and I'm going to specify the current working directory as the target for the build. The Docker build process will go through several steps, the first of which will be to download the SLES 15 base image. The system will then go through and make the changes required to import the self-signed certificate and run the zipper refresh transaction. The required software channels will be added to the system. The metadata will be cached down so that zipper is running inside the container and the appropriate software transaction can then be executed to install Apache. As noted here, we're now installing Apache. The system will download the 35 required RPMs to install the Apache web server. Once the file copy is complete, step 7 here will demonstrate the addition of the index.html. The container is now configured and the image creation is complete. If we query Docker images now, you will see that I have the Apache test container along with the SLES 15 SP1 container that was downloaded from registry.susa.com. To execute this container, we are going to use the docker run command. The minus D will detach the container process from the current terminal that we're executing this in. Minus P will publish the container on port 80, and we will execute this container on an interactive TTY. Once the container is running, we can go over to a web server and open up a new tab and verify by going to the local host port 80. You will see I've just created a simple web page here for the container. If we go back to the Docker daemon and do a Docker process list, you will also see that I've created the container. It's been running for 22 seconds, ex exposed on port 80. And if we wanted to access this container and inject a bash shell to inspect, I can use the docker exec command to specify that I want to add a bin bash process to this container, at which point you'll see my prompt changes. If I do a PSAUX in this container, the only processes running in this instance are going to be the web server. And if we look at Etsy OS release, this is all built on SLES 15 SP1. To exit the container, you can simply type exit. You can also kill the container by specifying docker kill and pasting the container ID. To finish up the session here, let's take a quick look at the registry.susa.com uh, server and service that the container images is being downloaded from. So as I mentioned, the SUSE container registry was introduced in the SLES 12 SP3 timeframe as we began to release tools like uh, SUSE CAS platform uh, 4.x that is frankly running Kubernetes from a containerized infrastructure. It's been integrated with the SUSE customer center 
it is there to provide a, train, a chain of trust in terms of looking at the content distribution network and making sure that the source of origin for the images is from SUSE and that it's a trusted source. And you actually do have the capability of mirroring content from the registry down to a, lot, a local uh, container registry. You could do this with tools like Scopio or other container registry mechanisms that have Docker-compatible interfaces for managing content. When we think about the use cases for the SUSE container registry, there is more software that SUSE is packaging in a containerized form factor these days, looking at how people are building out the software-defined infrastructure components of their landscape. So if you look at the example of the default images that are provided for both Enterprise 12 and 15, you'll find uh, regularly maintained images for all of the current shipping releases of SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 12, SP4, SP5, as well as SLE 15, SP1, and even SP2 coming up here very quickly, right? And these images, while they are maintained by SUSE and will be patched periodically based on security requirements, will typically be subscribed to a, an upstream software channel repository, whether that is potentially running out of SUSE Manager, an SMT server, or an RMT server. And as part of the container customization and deployment process, we have the ability to interface patch channels and do product updates as part of the container management version control and compliance reporting efforts. When we look at other products that are using Linux containers built on SUSE runtimes and running on our container host infrastructure, first and foremost is our container as a service platform, which is our Kubernetes distribution. Our Kubernetes distribution is regularly kept up to date and 90 5% of the distribution of the CAS platform is actually packaged into a Linux container consumption model, meaning that after we get the cryo container engine installed and the deployment tool in SCUBA installed, SCUBA will go out and actually pull all of the relevant containers for the CAS platform into the deployment environment for Kubernetes and then orchestrate the deployment and configuration of the cluster so that it operates as expected. When we think about workloads running on top of the container platform, our cloud application platform, or CAP, otherwise known as our Cloud Foundry distribution, is a good example of a platform as a service infrastructure that can be run on any Kubernetes environment. Um, it's certified for our container as a service platform, but it's also certified for the hyperscalers looking at AWS, Azure, Google and has the potential to run on distributed Kubernetes infrastructure. And we have packaged the cloud application platform again on the back end as a containerized implementation to get better economy from a utilization and resource management perspective. We also provide flexibility within CAP to have a container execution environment for the workload that's being deployed from a Cloud Foundry platform as a service perspective. And with the recent updates to SUSE Enterprise Storage and the introduction of Rook as a tech preview, we've also moved to containerized infrastructure for our Ceph distribution. This is in parallel to the traditional uh, salt minion based management mechanism. But when we think about container use cases for this application delivery scenario and being able to bring the storage closer to the applications and the workloads and being able to get management, capabilities and performance uh, throttling and management at that level. We've got a quite a bit of capability there and we're really looking forward to a fully supported Rook implementation from a storage perspective going forward as well. There's also a number of other container subsystem software components out there ranging from Portis to ingress controllers uh, which are managing uh, network connectivity and other components provided as the SUSE Helm Chart repo that can be put in place to help with um, assisting with your software-defined infrastructure deployment. When we look at the roadmap in the release of SLES 15 SP2, there is a roadmap to pro provide a web user interface for registry.suse.com later this summer. The SUSE Container Catalog is 
going to provide a application interface that's accessible to end users of the SUSE customer center so that they can manually inspect and look for the digest checksums of currently published containers and have access to information required to make use of these containers. There's also links to the getting started documentation as well as pointers to what container images are available and what architectures they have been posted for. This is a screenshot from the container registry web UI. You'll see an example here on how you could use the Docker pool from registry.susa.com to pull this image into your container host. We could also then overlay this container image into a Docker file, work through the customizations of adding additional software, and work to deploy an image, right? So let's take a closer look at the SUSE container registry. I've got a demo instance that I'd like to show you guys for a few minutes. Following the launch of SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 15 SP2 in July of 2020, there is a plan to enhance the SUSE Container Registry customer experience. The website you are currently viewing is a prototype interface that will eventually be added to registry.susa.com and integrated with the SUSE Customer Center. This web service will provide an index for the container images that have been posted to the registry so that customers can more easily browse and view what resources are available. If you view the detail information, you will find version control as well as architecture details for the images that have been posted, as well as package manifest information around what packages and what versions are contained in a specific container image. This will start out as a service to index the base images for SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, but will in the future be enhanced to include additional products that SUSE ships that rely on the SUSE Container Registry for installation and maintenance. So that should be a good highlight of where we're heading in terms of some of the end user consumption. The plan of record for the registry.susa.com is to start with the base Linux images being posted within that environment and eventually move into the surrounding containerized infrastructure offerings around the cloud application platform and SUSE CAS platform as we get through subsequent iterations of the Red registry UI and allowing our customers more visibility to the images that we're packaging and the version control around that so that it can be managed from both the compliance and an availability point of view. If we think about where to go from here, we have customers that are working through transformation in terms of modernization and standardization of their infrastructure. And if you think about workloads that can be packaged into a container consumption model, the idea would be that we could build a microservices infrastructure, use DevOps best practices for formalizing the development workflow, and ultimately standardize the container consumption model at a customer level for efficiency and controls that the operations teams are looking for. One little bonus that I will provide to you here is a tip on staging container content. I mentioned earlier that we have tools like Scopio that have the ability to interface with uh, API v2 compliant registries such as Docker registries, Docker Hub, or other local OCI layout compatible implementations. Scopio has the ability to bring down a local mirror of the content from registry.susa.com, very similar to how RMT brings down package channel contents from the SUSE Customer Center. You can actually execute Scopio on top of an RMT server, and this is part of the strategy that's been put together for customers with air gap requirements or customers who are looking to stage content from registry.susa.com, allowing for inspection of remote images, uh, showing properties, including layers, without requiring you to pull the actual image to the Docker host itself. Um, this will continue to be supported as part of the containers module and the SUSE CAS platform. If you reference the documentation below, this is an upstream project that we do collaborate on in the uh, Cloud, Na Cloud Native Compute Foundation communities, as well as uh, integrated as part of the solution for the um, Helm chart and container image 
mirroring needs of the SUSE container as a service platform. So as we're finishing up, I'd like to thank you for joining my session today. Um, I'm going to be available at a couple of designated times when the content is posted. Uh, with the SUSACON digital session, my contact info will also be available and I'll be monitoring the forums in case there are any questions from anybody who's attending. You can feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will also monitor the forums as appropriate. I would like to wish everybody a, a good SUSACON digital and thank you for your attention. Thank you and have a great day.